The October 3rd meeting of the Eden Prairie City Council will now come to order. I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prior to the start of each City Council meeting, we have an opportunity for open podium when residents of the city can address the city council on um, issues related to city business. The city council meetings are generally the first and third Tuesdays of each month, and if you wish to speak to us at open podium time, which is roughly 6.30 to 6.45, 6.55, please contact the city manager's office at 949-8412 by noon of the meeting date with your name, your telephone number, and the subject matter you wish to discuss. If time permits, after scheduled speakers are finished, then we will open the floor to um, unscheduled speakers. But if you want to be sure of an opportunity to speak, please let us know ahead of time. Open podium is not recorded or televised. Again, if you have any questions, contact the city manager's office at 949-8412. We'll start off with an HRA meeting. I'd like to call the HRA meeting to order. Is there a motion for approval of the minutes from the HRA meeting held on September 5th? So move we'll approval. Second. Any corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Uh, the next item is to adopt a resolution modifying redevelopment plans for the redevelopment project area number five. Mr. Getcho. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the HRA. You may recall at the previous council meeting we held a public hearing for this project and for this proposed uh, tax increment district and this is for, as you know, the um, Elevate mixed use project that's located, planned to be located at um, Southwest Station on the Anchor Bank and, and Ruby Tuesday site. The uh, new plan six story building with 222 apartment units and 13,000 uh, square feet of restaurant space. As you also know, um, there's um, a request and a um, agreement on behalf of the city to provide tax increment financing for the affordable housing portion of the project, the multi-housing project. And I believe it was Ms. Jeremiah and the project proponent that provided detailed presentation at the last meeting when we held the public hearing. So at tonight's HRA meeting, we're asking that the HRA take the action to um, adopt the resolution modifying the um, redevelopment plan for the redevelopment area, establishing TIF district number 22, adopting a TIF plan, and then approving and executing a tax increment development agreement with Elevate for this project. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Case. Yeah, just a quick comment. It really belonged back in the council meeting part of it. I, um, just reading the last statement stuck out to me a little bit here that the units will be initially marketed to people who live and work um, Indian Prairie or attend school or have attended school in Indian Prairie, which I like a lot. Obviously, we're all really interested in it. How, how do we um, ensure that in any way? And how? And is it just simply we're going to market it? Do we have any um, stronger ways of um, getting our Eden Prairie residents to have first, yeah. first so access to this? Yes, that's a good point. And, and that's something that's highlighted in this agenda. It was not discussed in detail at the last meeting, but Ms. Jeremiah can talk a little bit more about that. Yes, Your Honor, Councilmember Case, our Office of Housing and Community Services, um, particularly Molly Cuevamaki, and you may have uh, met Megan recently too, our newer staff person, would work with local um, employers such as the mall and with um, educational institutions such as Hennepin Tech and try to make people aware um, that these are coming and look for candidates for them. Great. And basically, we've provided that as a, as a service to the developer so that we can accommodate our Eden Prairie residents and employees. And um, once the first unit becomes actually occupiable, then that 
requirement would go away. We would continue to work with them, but it's kind of a pre-leasing situation. So after they're really available, it becomes more open. Great, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, is there a motion? I, I would move to adopt a resolution modifying redevelopment plan for redevelopment project area number five establishing TIF District 22, adopting a TIF plan and approving and authorizing execution of the tax increment development agreement for Elevate at Southwest Station. Second. Hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Is there a motion to adjourn the HRA meeting? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, then we go back into our council meeting. The first item is a donation from Kinderbury Hill. Uh, Mr. Lathammer. Yes, Your Honor, Council Members, this is a contribution from Kinderbury Hill Child Development Center. It's for $1,500 uh, going towards our 2017 Kid Stock program and also contributing towards our summer musical Honk. Um, Kinderbury has been a partner of ours for quite some time, both um, for contributions and also assisting at some of our events. So we really appreciate the work that they do and the partnership, but also the financial contribution. Great, thank you. Is there a motion? I move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation from Kinderberry Hill Child Development Centers in the amount of $1,500 to be used toward kids stock entertainment and the summer musical honk. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. Aye. Is there a motion for approval of the agenda? So move. Second. Any additions? Anything to delete? Okay, I don't hear anything. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Is there a motion for approval of the minutes from the City Council workshop held on Tuesday, September 19th? So moved. Second. Any corrections there? Hearing none, all in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Motion passes. I'd like a motion for approval of the City Council meeting minutes from our City Council meeting that was held the same date, September 19th. Move approval. Second. Any corrections to those? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. The next item is uh, the consent calendar, items A through E. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any items for discussion? Uh, Mayor, Mayor, one just addition. On item D, uh, we might need some language revisions that might occur yet between the city attorney and the representatives of Motorola. So if you could just add to the motion of the consent agenda that item D is subject to the approval of the city attorney, that would be helpful because it may slightly change the language okay. that's in that, in, that, in that maintenance agreement for that software. Okay, do we need to make a formal um, amendment to the original motion? I think you can just agree to what I stated. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Not sure who seconded you. But I did? I can't remember. We're, Sherry and I are both in agreement with yes. whoever seconded. <laughs> yes, we are. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. We have no public hearings tonight. Uh, that brings us to the payment of claims. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Uh, any items to question? Hearing none, this is a, a roll call vote. Councilmember Butcher Wexton? Aye. Councilmember Case? Aye. Councilmember Nelson? Aye. Mayor Tara Lukens? Aye. Uh, the next item on the agenda tonight is a report from our Park and Rec Director, Mr. Lathammer, a pickleball update. Did you want to introduce anything on that, Mr. Getchell? I'll hand it over okay. to Mr. Lathammer. Your Honor, Council Members, uh, tonight we have another uh, pickleball update for you. We were back in uh, January and then also in July and back again here tonight. Um, I will let you know that there isn't any action required tonight. Um, it'll bring you up to date on our discussion that we had with the Parks Commission last night as well as some of the cost estimates that we were able to obtain and some other uh, methods and timelines of if we were to move forward with the project, what that would look like. So I want to just do a brief but not too distant history here. Uh, 2016, we completed the feasibility study looking at locations where uh, pickleball courts, multiple pickleball courts uh, could be located. Uh, we came back before the council then to report back in January 
Um, and the council at that point did have an action item to approve that the Southwest Pickleball, Southwest Metro Pickleball Association would be authorized to move forward with a fundraising and naming rights uh, effort. July uh, 2017, we were asked to give council feedback on the process. Uh, we did that, and one of the things that was asked of us was to move forward with cost estimates, bring that back to the council. And so essentially that's what you're, you're going to see uh, tonight. One of the things um, that, as you know, has been happening in, with the pickleball world, it has been evolving and it has been changing. We got involved in 2012, one of the first in the metro area to establish courts over at Pioneer Park in 2012. Um, we saw good use at those locations, and so we then um, striped over at, Pioneer, or at uh, Riley Lake Park, so a multi-use, again, of both tennis and pickleball. Our first kind of foray into the permanent courts was at Franlo just a couple years ago, and they have certainly uh, been well used and are, are well loved and well um, cared for. What we have seen change over those last four or five years, um, we have seen a new surface at Pioneer Park where many of the pickleball players don't feel that it bounces hard enough and so we're not seeing as much play over at Pioneer Park. We have been doing some research and the uh, type of material that we used has a opportunity to be hardened using another layer over top of it. Will it get it to be as hard as some of the other courts like at Franlo? There's not a guarantee, but we're trying to span. If you drop a pickleball at Franlo, it bounces about 26 inches. At Pioneer, it bounces about 24 inches. So hardening it, we can get it closer to the 26. Will it be exactly? We're not sure. And it's not a high cost to do that. So that's one thing that we have in the mix to also think about. Our neighbors have been approaching trying to expand or to get into the pickleball game. We've seen that around us. Um, Chanhassen has added some. Uh, Bloomington has added some. Recently, Edina had five, their first five and only five come on board. And so we're starting to see where people go, how far they travel. We're starting to see that change who plays where. One of the things we've observed is that Lake Riley is, it's not as busy as it used to be for a couple of reasons. One, I think people are playing more over at Chanhassen to go to the west. And um, the other piece I think is um, as you get a taste and, and enjoy using places like Franlo with the permanent courts and the right size fencing and the lines that are only for pickleball, that has become more of the standard um, and, uh, and certainly a preference to do. So as we move forward, uh, thinking about multi-use pickleball courts, some people will still use them. I think in a neighborhood park situation, um, it's the right thing to do. But I think for people that play pickleball on a regular basis, they will almost always look to play on pickleball only courts. And so that's something to keep in mind. There's a couple other uh, places around us that we think are going to move forward with some more pickleball courts to our north, uh, Minnetonka. They did um, have a project that they were hoping to do um, and they opened bids this past uh, summer and they determined that the price was too high and so they rejected the bids. We understand that they're going to go out this next um, January, February. They've been doing some things in order to hopefully make the bids come in lower and be able to have courts in Minnetonka. We know that Shakopee and Jordan and Prior Lake, they're also trying to get some courts online as well. So we think in the next several years, we will see other communities um, doing more within those communities, which may change um, how people use our courts especially the dual purpose courts too. So that's something to keep in mind. We've also looked at what about that concept that now that a lot of people know how to play, know the rules, there's some that like to come together with a big group and have a social piece to it. But we're also finding is that there's some people that don't want any part of that. They want to play for an hour straight and they want to play with the other three people that they know and are at the same skill level and want a social experience just with them. 
And so looking out at other areas, um, where could we provide that? And also where could we get it a little more into the neighborhood so families and kids might also have that uh, better and maybe for them a more comfortable opportunity to play. So these are some courts, Hidden Ponds, Nesbitt and Rice Marsh that in the next three to five years, they're not in great shape now and we have them programmed in to be redone. In some cases, could we add one or two courts? There would be enough room to do that. Um, we wanna be careful in neighborhood parks because um, if it's too close to houses and if there's too many, we start to over park it. We also start to make the neighbors not very happy uh, with the sport of pickleball. So we wanna be sensitive to that. At Forest Hills at any time, there's two tennis courts there right now at Forest Hills. We could put temporary lines and temporary nets, but we're leery to do that because of how we're not seeing other temporary net locations being used. So that might um, not, we, it's something we would line and um, people may not go there. So that's just something to keep in mind as we move forward over the years. Um, we do have tennis courts and basketball courts that are in pretty rough shape that need to be uh, resurfaced or reconstructed that there may be a possibility to add a couple things on. Mr. Case, that's a question. Jake, if I can ask a quick question while we're there. Um, these, these places around the city where we might want to consider these satellite locations, not, not the, um, the complex for a tournament or something, but just the, the two pickleball courts, where we have like two tennis courts, do we have good data right now on how used the tennis courts are? So we could conceivably keep a tennis court, redo it, convert one to two permanent you know, pickleball, keep a basketball location, go, go that route? I mean, do we have good data on that, that this might be the time? We're, we're, I'm really gonna be talking two things tonight, as you might be, that this satellite concept out there, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the complex idea yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, because that, that satellite piece really does get at addressing some of, of our community needs, certainly. Well, um, let me just, I'll give you a, a little bit of an anecdotal. Uh, last Wednesday night, um, I was looking to play tennis with three other people. Uh, we went to Central Middle School, eight court location. We couldn't play, they were all being used. We said, let's go to Miller, it's kind of close by, two court location. They were both being used. I got there first, so I called my, my uh, teammates and said, let me go check Rice Marsh Lake, it's not that far away before you go any further and we keep chasing around town. Luckily, we got there and that one court was open and available. It's not our best court, I'll tell you that. There's some two inch cracks. It's maybe not quite as bad as what Starring is, but it's pretty close. So that I think leads to why it was open. However, after we got done playing and I drove home, there were people playing um, at Starring as I went by driving home. So the amount of use that we see or I see uh, the week before I was up at, I played in the last two weeks um, up at Halasic Hills, um, four courts up there, we have a lot of senior tennis programs or leagues that play there in the morning, but also at night. Um, when I've been there, both this this last Saturday night and also the win, or it was the Monday before that, those courts were in use too. Um, and even, uh, I've been at uh, Central Middle School again within the last few weeks, playing from maybe about five to six, and at six o'clock, all courts were full. And one of the things we are seeing is um, especially on the tennis side of things. Um, as, as myself and my, my other partners left, it was all people of Indian descent that were playing on those courts by the time we left. And so there is a recent immigrant phenomenon to who is also playing tennis at this point in time. But we don't, um, you know, our tennis program numbers have increased. We don't, we don't do counts on the courts. It's all anecdotal and you'll hear um, just the opposite of, I've driven by that court five times and haven't seen anybody on it. You'll, you'll hear that, and it can depend on what time of the day. Um, we can say that about any one of our facilities. So um, we have, in the past, I, I mentioned before in another presentation, we have been right-sizing, and we've been doing that in all of the amenities throughout the park system. So some of the ball fields that have maybe been pulled out, and now they're more open field space to be a little more conducive to many different things. Um, 
but in a lot of cases where there were two bas or two pickleball courts, one it was converted to a tennis and a basketball, and that was happening 15, 12, 10 years ago too. So we don't have a lot of places where there are the two. An example of uh, hidden ponds where there are two tennis courts. There is a space in the middle there, and so when we need to go in and reconstruct that, that space and maybe just a little bit more would be able to fit two tennis or two pickleball courts. We wouldn't recommend getting bigger again due to parking, due to neighborhood, but that's a place where you could have two permanent pickleball courts working well with a basketball, working well with a tennis. You've only added to the neighborhood park, you haven't taken anything away, which is one thing that when we first started looking at Pioneer, the neighbors came out loud and clear for the love of the current tennis court. And so in order to assure them, that's where it was dual use. At first the concept was, can you turn that in to a pickleball only? And it was really the neighbors coming out and talking to us and saying, no, we go there at night with our kids or on the weekends with our kids. Um, so um, we've been looking in these, these uh, courts that I listed, Hidden Ponds, Nesbitt, Rice Marsh. We could, we could sneak one or two into those spots and we don't think it'd be a big impact to the park and it'd be an amenity to the neighborhood. And so I think that ups our, ups our game on the variety of activities. Councilmember Nelson. Where are we looking for to have multiple pickleball courts? I think that was uh, part so of our last discussion <laughs> was is that we felt that we did need some other place with multiple pickleball courts and you know obviously parking that goes with them so that you could have a tournament style pickleball play. I don't think that's any more unreasonable than needing the baseball fields to do that or whatever. So when we were here in July and presented the feasibility study, the location is Starring Lake um, near the tennis, basketball, and sand volleyball. So this next slide that I'm showing you is that location. Okay. Um, we looked at how many can you fit on the site. And this is how many you can fit on the site. Um, you can have the basketball, have the tennis, and you could get up to 12 pickleball courts on the side, uh, side of that. So just to orientate you to the upper right is where the park building is. Straight up above is where the oval skating rink is. You come in in the bottom right side, you come into the park itself. I want to tell you about what, what this fully is. Um, you're seeing a, a little bit of a redo of the direction of the pathways so that we have really good accessibility. In between those pickleball courts, so you see six on one side, six on the other side, in between there is a concrete plaza. We've listened to what pickleball players have wanted, asked for, told us was deficient at other places, and so this concept takes all of that into play. You uh, see um, in the middle there, you see benches for gathering. Over top of that, you see a shade, a couple shade structures, very similar to what's at the, or at the uh, Starring Lake play structure with those big umbrellas. You also see four high top tables that would have umbrellas on it too, so that people can watch and wait and gather. In between each pickleball court, there is a fence so that the ball does not um, go from one pickleball court to the other pickleball court. Um, and then also around all of the pickleball courts, there are fences. Around the tennis court and the basketball court, um, at least on one side of the basketball court, there is a fence. Um, the other part of the basketball court is not fenced. Between the tennis court and the pickleball plaza, there's a drinking fountain that's accessed by both. And then to the north of the right hand, upper right-hand corner of the basketball court, there is a uh, water fountain as well. There are a lot of people that walk ar around the, the lake and up through this area, so a water fountain with um, both a dog bowl and also a, a jug filler people bowl too. So um, in the upper right, you also see some recycling and some trash. You see some bike racks. Probably um, from a visual standpoint, that bottom um, portion in green, light green, that's where we would have to deal with all of the storm water. This is a lot of hard surface that needs to be drained. And so we would lose about 34 trees. Also the berms that you see right now, those berms kind of get inverted and they become holes or detention areas for, for the water. So um, that's one thing that uh, limits the amount of courts and also where we can place the courts. 
when we looked at the feasibility study, this was a good spot because there is already parking, so you're not adding large parking costs. There is already a building with bathrooms um, and uh, electricity, so that also made this a, a positive. So a couple things that uh, come up in the pricing. I should tell you, we've been using HTPO, who we use for a lot of our park projects, and city uh, engineering uses them as well for other projects and estimation. And so this pricing includes the plans that we would have to pay them for in order to develop plans and specifications. It also includes the grading, the lighting, the fencing, and all of the site amenities to that. And so when you look at four pickleball, one tennis, one basketball, and in that configuration, the sand volleyball would be able to stay where it is, you have a price of about $650,000. Now, all of this is scalable, so you might say, well, what would it be for six? Mm -hmm. It's right in between four and eight, basically, getting in that you know, mid 700,000. But we asked them to do it for pricing and for our consideration at four, eight, and 12. Um, the eight, you also look at uh, $840,000, and then if you go to the 12, you look at it um, as about a million dollar uh, total project. So just going back and looking at some of the benefits of each one of those numbers, and again, we can talk about six or we can talk about eight. Uh, even numbers are probably good to talk about the way it works out, but um, what you get out of a four court hard pickleball surface, you also get four permanent on the, or four temporary potential on the tennis court. So if there was gonna be a tournament similar to like is um, happening at the hometown celebration using the Round Lake tennis courts for a weekend tournament or a nighttime tournament, you could um, mark those. Not the best situation, but you could for in some cases make that happen. Um, it does give you the most variety of activities because the sand volleyball stays, the basketball, the tennis, all of that stays. Um, the least amount of impact, and I'll talk to you a little bit more, especially later about the conversation with the Parks Commission. Almost a two, two hour conversation last night amongst the commission members. Um, but there were uh, over 50 events there last year that were just rental events that happened out of the park building and the pavilion itself with over 4,000 people. So it's birthday parties, it's graduation parties, it's uh, people's wedding anniversaries, those kinds of things that happen there. So there's concern about the impact, especially on a large number of courts, what that would have to the general user of, of those facilities. On top of that, we also um, hold all of our concerts there during the summer, several movies in the park. The Rotary Rib Fest is there. Um, when we've talked about it with, and, and the theater is there too, so there's some trade-offs there. When we've talked about it, especially as it gets to a larger number of courts, we've talked about it as needing, in some cases, pickleball would have to be um, shut down for those particular nights in order to accommodate the other major community events that are happening there. Um, it is truly makes it a community facility and a community park when you think of all the many activities that already are there and happen there. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good impact to have um, the permanent courts at that location. The other piece, and this again is one of the items that I'll talk more about that the Parks Commission really talked about, but having this as a incremental approach, um, doing a few first, seeing what happens, understanding the use patterns, but also understanding what happens when Minnetonka adds eight, what happens when Shakopee brings some online, what happens when other communities add more, um, the concept of would we be overbuilt for what our city or our community's needs are, one way to get a look at that is to do this incrementally. And that also, I think, when we get to the commission's comments too, it goes to their concern for pushing other um, important things off to fund this, to not, not really extend us too far out, um, especially with a use that is still evolving and we may not know. The feeling was probably don't have any regrets of doing four. If you do all at once, you might wish you wouldn't have used your money that way and they might not get the use that you would have hoped. Would they still have big tournaments every once in a while? 
sure, but what would that do to the overall use of, of the other things in the park? So that was another uh, comment or, or discussion amongst the Parks Commission. You know, eight is kind of in that, in that middle ground. Um, you get uh, eight permanent, four temporary. The sand volleyball would need to be relocated. We could likely keep it really close to the site, um, slide it to the east towards the parking lot, um, so it wouldn't have to go away from that area completely. Um, but that certainly adds a little bit to the cost of the project too. The 12 permanent, um, obviously that is your biggest, uh, more of a regional. Currently around us, the most uh, in any one uh, location is six. And so having 12 for uh, temporary that could go with that, that really takes us to a regional amenity. Could you run some um, tournaments? I, it'd be pretty attractive to running tournaments, especially with the um, permanent net situations. Um, but there certainly would be more conflicts with other things going on in the park and there might be some things that if we were gonna do a tournament, we would have to shut the building down or we couldn't do other events. So there becomes just some more strategy and, and uh, things bumping up against each other. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Case. Uh, you, you may get to this when you start looking, when you start looking at dollars, but um, just more curious because it's relevant in the moment. Between the building eight and the $840,000 costs, and then if you move to grade for the 12, but you don't build the 12, you grade it, do you still have to do the uh, NERP pond behind it, the stormwater drainage? Could, could, how much between 840000 and a million if you plan for the 12, but you only built the eight? Um, that is considered in there. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea of how and why, there, the biggest cost driver ends up to be the asphalt piece. And, and there is a, a good contingency number in here, and I think that's important at this stage because we haven't done soil samples or soil testing in that area. And um, so there could be a surprise there. The other piece that I think I'd recommend a good contingency, which is in this number, um, for is we don't, you know, asphalt, which is the biggest part of this, asphalt is driven by oil prices. We see the fluctuation with oil. And if we were to bid this in January, February, there's some pretty good uncertainty right now given hurricanes and oil production and those kinds of things. So I would say though, I feel comfortable with these numbers based on having a good contingency. I don't think we would exceed these numbers. That's likely that they would come in at or below. However, if we were to do the less than 12 and say maybe sometime we want to come back and go to 8 or go to 10 or go to 12, um, we would likely not have to take out as many trees all at once. Um, the storm water, you would probably, the eastern part of it, you wouldn't have to um, size that as large, so that would get downsized um, in kind of a scale to the rest of the project. So that's where you have some of those savings, but you still have that capability. And we have a pretty flat site as it is. So um, to be able to come back and lay down two next to four or two next to six or two or four next to whatever, you, it, it's not so in difficult theory, to do it. If we built six or eight at the cost close to what you estimated uh, with the idea that um, we could easily add two or four more, the cost would be incremental to what you have there. So um, there wouldn't be necessarily additional setup costs or um, grading or that. You're, am I hearing yeah, you right? There, okay. There's a um, little bit of site prep, but we, not We have a lot of um, experience up on that. I would think on that entire sand bluff, you know, that was a glacial push. I mean, I would think up and down that entire ridge, we probably have not been surprised on soil samples. So I would guess we have experience with that. Um. <laughs> I mean, I live there, but I, but the whole thing I mean, is about 100 feet of sand straight down. And Grace Church found it, and we found it up on the airport. And these, I mean, I'm, I'd be surprised if there's anything but sand as soon as you go down two feet. Uh, well, mostly what we found historically is soil problems in projects are things that we at some point in our own history have put there that we probably shouldn't have. Okay. Nobody, you know, when the road was done, and certainly not this last time it was done and widened, but who knows when it was gotcha. upgraded, exactly what we found at the community center. There was nobody around here who would have said, I think they might have dumped a bunch of stuff and buried right. it. Got it. 
Those it was are things an old, that you can. But it I was an old farm site, right where the um, pavilion sits. So, okay, great, yeah. thanks. Um, so, Nelson had a question. Too. Yeah, I'd sort of like to see it at the eight level. I do want to see the benches, you know, for people to sit and wait and congregate. If you do the tables, I'd suggest you do them regular height instead of the high top because this may get into a more younger kid situation coming in and doing it. And even for a lot of seniors, high tops aren't the, always the easiest height. Um, but it would make it more useful for all ages to have regular height tables. Um, and I do see you know, more and more kids, as, as their parents learn how to play it, more kids are starting to play it too. Um, but I think the eight, would, you know, I don't see it having to go to 12. But I would like to, I like Ron's idea of expanding out. I think four is too little. You know, I certainly wouldn't want to see less than six, but I think eight might be a nice compromise for it, especially if you can move the sand volleyball close. There's nothing that says it has to be at exactly the same place where people can't walk an extra 100 feet and find it. You know, especially if it's a new, nicely done one. Uh, I get more complaints about there's glass or something in the sand for that now. But um, you know, four I really think is too little. And you know, I can see the reason to do it at eight, but it does need to come with, a, you know, I like those benches and some shade things and other people take. Plus I can see if they're gonna have a tournament, they have to clear it with through your office, just like when people rent baseball things. and. You'll say no if there's a big production or a play going on. Um, you know, here's your alternative weekends that you could do it. I, I would see that as perfectly reasonable. I don't see it on well, the summertime. They'd have to know they couldn't have it on the same day as the kids um, play that they do what Tuesday mornings or something. You know, there'd have to be some working between the two groups to make sure that they're not trying to plan it when something else major is in the park, you know, regularly scheduled. But I would think that would be perfectly possible. They'd just pick a different day of the week to always do it, or two different days. So, so I know eventually the council is going to want to consider how do you pay for this in oh yeah. terms of you always maybe have to what consider the cost how of the project is and, and what the number is. And so um, this next slide. Um, Before you go on to that, Jay, yeah. um, Sherry has mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I know that um, we always have so many competing interests and we have to balance and weigh things out very carefully and make decisions very carefully. I also know that, you know, just like all of us, um, I've had a number of folks mention to me that they really enjoy pickleball and would like to see, you know, greater numbers, which is why you've done this assessment. But Jay, what is your, I mean, so we have to project, right, uh, best we can and make the best decisions we can. So given that there will be this sort of greater, greater regionality around pick, pickleball. So if you live closer to Minnetonka or closer to Shakopee on that end of Eden Prairie, you probably, you might want to go in that direction instead of, you know, drive further in the city that you live. So I guess my question, and, and maybe this is not something you're going to be able to answer for me, but so given sort of this, all these factors that we have to look at and think about, um, what, what do you think the ideal number will be? Okay, now this is a tough one, like mm -hmm. five years from now. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we're this is a lot of outlay of money. Mm -hmm. So five years from now, or even four years from now, where do you think we would be um, with a decision at four, six, eight? I think it, it depends on what you want this to be or what you want to have. If you want to have a regional facility, a regional traction, uh. um, then having closer to 12 is that is a number. Um, you have to be able and willing to accept that that's a lot of people that don't live in Eden Prairie and the money that you're spending on those additional courts right. are to have them playing on those courts. In terms of then can you have some more tournaments? You could have some more tournaments and primarily on the weekends, but we couldn't have them every weekend or, or all of those people that have been using the park 
as is, the building, the shelter, the new play area, using it for the rib fest and the theater, that, that can't, it can't happen every weekend. So you have to, I think you have to weigh that. I think historically, all of you have kind of watched um, sports evolve over time and kind of what government has, has kind of done. Sometimes we've been, and this goes back to baseball fields and tons of young kids, and we built a lot of fields, and all of a sudden we said we had too many fields. And at that point, we couldn't keep up with soccer. And I mean, I'm taking you back into the 70s even, and there's been spikes in tennis, and we right-sized with that. In most cases, our reaction has been to overbuild and scale back. And I think the conversation at the Parks Commission last night was to avoid doing that and to make sure we spend all of that money wisely is if you do it incrementally, that is a method that helps you ensure that you didn't overspend, you didn't overbuild, you didn't do it at a location that maybe couldn't fully hold all that. And it doesn't mean that you're not providing opportunities. Um, and, you know, the really the large number is about more like tournaments. And the large number is about assuming that lots of people want to gather together at the same time. And there is some of that. We see 40 people at Franlow. If we had the same number or four or six courts at Starring, I think we would see 40 to 50 to 60 people there. I would hope it wouldn't bring them all over from Franlow um, because we have seen that Riley dissipating in use. And again, some of that's because it's not permanent courts. So projecting out a way to hedge and a way to guard against that we don't spend money that um, we might regret, I think that's a way that you could build some, could see how it shakes out, how other people, other communities are building. And if their people are staying home instead of coming to Eden Prairie, some are gonna wanna keep coming here to play with their Eden Prairie friends. But some of our Eden Prairie people might go to Minnetonka to play with their Minnetonka friends. So where that's going to happen and evolve, there's going to be, as fast as the landscape has changed since 2012, I think it's going to change in these next three or four years. Um, and that was a conversation at the Parks Commission that really came back to what I'll share their recommendation with you as well. You got one more question. Well, I do. So first of all, this whole notion, this value of incrementalism over quantum change has been a value of the city council for the past two decades. So I hear what you're saying with that. And that's how we do our business here. So good, that's good <laughs> um, that we keep that uh, front of mind. But um, so the, just so I get this, mm -hmm. so the, in order for it to be like this regional, now that's a huge decision, I think, for this council um, to make a decision about whether we want to be this regional, um, attraction, pickleball attraction. That's a that's a conversation I think we have to really think a lot about. But um, are you saying then if we build 8 to 12, that would be the regional definition? So then to serve our folks here in Eden Prairie, it would be 4 to 6, 4 to 8? I mean, I know I'm trying to pin you down. I no, no, you that, that's <laughs> fine. I mean, because that's, that was a long discussion amongst the Parks Commission last night. And to, um, to go right to their recommendation, then I can come back and tell you how we could fund some things. But to go right to their recommendation, they felt you um, have a base bid of four courts, and then you could have alternates. And remember, we've done this with many other projects when we might not be sure of what that number might come back at, the real number when we go out to bid. Their recommendation was you go four pickleball with the basketball and tennis okay. um, as the base bid with the ability to go from to six or eight if additional funding and fundraising were to become available but they also said no more than eight. We don't believe that the carrying capacity of that park and how it would impact all of those other users that are there using the park above eight, at least in the short term, they don't, in the conversation they had, and those who have used other areas of the park felt that that would 
be too much. Um, so eight would be their recommendation to go max. Now, somewhere down the road, might that prove itself to be able to handle more? Possibly. But they felt to provide community use, to add to our current community inventory, four is what the city should fund with six or up to eight funded in some other manner like naming rights or fundraising purposes, which as I show you the timeline of how we could make this happen, all of, all of that's doable to write our specifications to have a base bid of any number and then to be able to say, to add two more, here's what it would be, mm -hmm. or to add four more, here's what it would be. So that gets to my point that I made in the very beginning that those kinds of decisions to land on any number um, can come back to the council at that point in time. And then you're dealing with actual real numbers to be able to evaluate. Now the other side of the real numbers is where does the money come from? Because as you remember back to the feasibility study, this hasn't been in the budget anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, with the exception of, and this next slide that's up, the tennis court and the basketball court, if you go there now, there are inch to two inch wide cracks through that. <clears throat> Um, we had that, we wish we'd have had it a little bit sooner, but we've got a lot of other projects to try to fund at the same time. So we had that out in 2019 to uh, be reconstructed at about 100,000. That's a little on the low side, I think, of what it really would have taken when we opened bids for it, had we waited and done it in 2019. We can accelerate that, that, can, that could go towards it. The other piece is the picnic pavilion and building that are there at Starring Lake, we thought about, could we move that out? We can, there's a lot of concern about how far we can move it out. Our entrances, our doorways, they're not where they need to be. Um, I don't believe that the roof is gonna start to leak or it's gonna fall in, but it is one of our sorest thumbs in the entire park system. And with over 50 rental kinds of uses, not to mention our busiest winter use with skating and sliding. It's time has come. Can we limp by for a few more years in order to maybe put this kind of project ahead of it? We can, but our concern is not to wait for too long. And so the more we bite off on this project, probably in a cash flow sense, the longer we have to push that out. Because as you've seen, our capital reinvestment, which includes roads and other city buildings and many other things, our fund balance is going down. And so there isn't a, a idea that there's extra dollars, it's just how do you reorder certain projects? And, and this isn't one that we can just not do. We're very soon and we had planned for to be redoing it in 2018. But we think that if the council through looking to find a funding source, this is one thing that um, we could push out a little bit further when we come back to do the next round of the CIP, you would see it in there um, fairly soon. Um, so that's and I a- know, And I know that um, we've been responsive. I mean, Pickleball started in 2012, something like that. And so we were five years into it. And I know we've tried um, to respond to our residents who would like to have um, uh, more courts yeah. Yes, and we've so added. The other fund uh, funding source would be fundraising. And uh, the update on that is there hasn't been any dollars raised um, to date um, for from Southwest Metro Pickleball. Um, so I can't tell you if uh, it will happen, if there will be any dollars available when we were to get to bid time. Um, certainly if uh, it could be a challenge like the council has done to uh, for other organizations to say, um, you know, if we're gonna go from four to six or whatever that might be, um, you need to come up with. And I've certainly spent time with them outlining what other associations um, have fundraised, their methods of fundraising, what some of those expectations have been. Um, that went um, several meetings before we came in January to have them ask permission for you to uh, allow them to go forward with a fundraising effort. Um, but today I, I don't have a strong feeling that we would see much uh, money there. Um, at this point, there, there isn't money there. Okay. 
Thank you. Yes. Are you done, Sherry, or no? Yep, I'm all done. Councilmember okay. Pace. So first place, I appreciate very much the advice and counsel of our commissions. We um, appoint people who we feel are have expertise uh, to give us direction. So I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way discounting. In fact, I really appreciate their look at this. It doesn't mean we always uh, go with whatever um, a commission says simply because we have a, um, a broader political and a very positive context, broader political perspective looking out for the needs of everyone. A anyway, so I appreciate um, what the Parks Commission came up with, but it seems like in, in this issue of how many courts, there's really two aspects to it, and I'm hearing both come out from your um, words and, and, and advice, but I, I kind of heard more one from the Parks Commission, but there's this idea of just general raw number of courts, you know, how many, how many courts do we need? And in that context, it is important if Minnetonka has four and Bloomington has two and Chaska, you know, that, that's important. And, and the satellite courts become relevant in that context, just having enough around. But, but in, in my, all my conversations with uh, my newfound pickleball friends, uh, but people that have been um, emailing and chatting with me, and, and when I've had the opportunity um, three times now, I think, to attend um, um, maybe twice, the last two Fourth of Julys, I feel like there's one other one, um, tournaments that have been held up at Round Lake Park over Fourth of July. There's this, um, there's this socialization of the game. There's, there's, um, it's, it's like I don't go out to dinner just to eat food. I go out to enjoy the company I'm with and drink wine. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a broader um, picture. And, and I think that's what I'm hearing from pickleball players, that it's the getting people together and um, having a four-hour tournament and, and the joy and fun of all that. And in that context, uh, they're very limited by two courts or four courts or even in some cases six. I, I don't know that it's up to Eden Prairie to supply or meet that need. Um, granted, you know, one could argue, well, why isn't Minnetonka building 12 or why isn't Bloomington building 12? I understand that. Um, we do, uh, well, and let me also caveat, I, I don't think it's up to Eden Prairie to be number one in everything. I just think we, I've always said to people um, over the years that we can't do it all, but we have to do enough, and that's arguable and debatable what enough is, but um, enough to me in pickleball, it feels like, is, is to have a critical mass of courts that allows the two aspects of the game. And, and if it takes uh, getting eight at Starring, I mean, optimally 12, but if it takes getting eight at Starring Lake to forego some of our satellite ones and twosies out there, uh, in the short term, so in the next five years, just so we can have the number of courts, but we're going to put them all in one place, then I would favor that. And I and I do just in listening to everything, talking to people, listening to you, I I think the eight courts minimally makes the most sense right now, and you grade it for ten or twelve. Um, but I like the idea that you don't build the um, stormwater drainage channel to hold ten or twelve until you need to, because you can always just dig it because it's sand, um, but, but, but maybe it's a farm site too, so I don't know, it could be a dump. Um, every farm had one, uh, but you know, I, I think there are ways to do the eight, including, I mean, I'd love to get a new pavilion up there, but I've been up there a lot, I mean, through the years, every three or four times a year with classrooms over the years, and you know, it's very much feeling an early 80s kind of pavilion. It does seem structurally in, in uh, fine shape. I wonder if a coat of paint and, uh, you know, new shingles could get us another five years. I just think there's a way that, that we could take that money and do what we need to do right now to get eight, which I think meets the so socialization need mm. and numbers of court need. And then in talking with some pickleball um, people, you know, if every city is going to the same pickleball association saying raise money, that's not going to happen, right? But if um, if the pickleball association has an incentive in some city that steps up to the plate to say, um, okay, we'll build eight, but if you all go out and raise money, uh, we'll get 10 or 12 in there. I think there's suddenly a, an incentive to do. If, um, if we only build four, there's no money potential, it sounds like, to be raised out there because... You know, because everybody has four, and, and I, I just don't, it, it's the um, 
chicken or egg kind of thing. I mean, which one's going to come first? And I think we need to get a cr critical mass of courts there. And then I think um, we, from what I'm understanding, talking to some pickleball people, I think there might be a potential to get some decent fundraising going. So I'm, I'm just laying it out there. I mean, we're early. We don't have to decide this tonight. Um, but um, I think staff is probably looking for direction. But I think Starting Lake Park is a great place for this critical mass of a, of a minimum number. Um, I think it is a great amenity for our city to have a place that is beginning to be on the cutting edge of a really cool exploding sport that would attract people. Uh, last I looked at the demographics of Eden Prairie, not that only older people play pickleball. In fact, that's one of the advantages is ex expanding into um, younger ages. But nonetheless, it's still an attractive sport for aging people. And Eden Prairie is filled with us <laughs> more and more and more. And I mean, we're right on, to be on the cusp and cutting edge of doing the right thing right now. I, I th I'd be pretty proud of Eden Prairie to do that. So I, I just think, um, I think the eight for me tonight sitting here listening to all this is the minimum that would um, accomplish this. And I think we can find ways to fund it. If uh, I could Weber. give you a, yeah, just you a, have more presentation, don't you? Yeah, and a comment on the fundraising, because I have heard the chicken and the egg, and that wasn't something that the Parks Commission was really, um, didn't take well to, and um, last that, that comment last night of the chicken or the egg, because of what we've seen in reality for fundraising. <coughs> um, the Hockey Association came forward in 2006 or seven and said, we want a third sheet of ice. Council said, come back with a million dollars and we'll talk. It didn't take them more than a few months to come back with a million dollars. Um, we said, we can't fund the observatory. Two days later, it was 100% funded. Um, we said, um, there's a need at Miller Park for barrier free. We did that in phase one as 100% fundraised, and that fundraising happened in a few short months. We got it built, people said, this is awesome, we should do more. That next set of fundraising happened in a few months. The Fox Jets came to you and said, can we do this? And within several months, they had 90% of their funds raised. And so what I have seen in at Veterans Memorial, Fox, that's all of those that I've listed out. Once the fundraising is authorized and you go out and you start to ask, what we have seen every time is that about 60 to 70% of what you're ever gonna raise comes in in the first few months. And then it trickles after that. And so I would be concerned that there's any appetite out there, whether it's from the individuals involved or corporations involved to fund this type of a project, whether it's four, eight, or 12, because what has been presented for fundraising purposes has been 12. Mm -hmm. And there is that concept that that's the best because you would get the most, um, if you were Wells Fargo or if you were Super America, you would get the most exposure by 12. Nobody has come forward or has been willing yet um, with some effort already happening to fundraise. So I, I just want to be up front with the council that this is likely not going to have a lot of dollars from the outside coming in. It will be all internal uh, dollars. So, so my next slide is just timeline um, because there we hear that there is a, a urgent need and how fast can we do this and, and really it can happen fast. Um, we would be able to um, have plans and specifications drawn up. We could have that done before January, which the council action for that would be us coming back, if not next council meeting, the one after that, to say we have a contract um, that we'd like approved with a consultant to do those plans and specifications. We're probably talking in the neighborhood of 60 to 100,000, depending on how big of a project it is. That's what it, that's what it would cost. So that would be a council action item, likely um, within the next month, month and a half that we would come back with. And that 60 to 100,000 is already built into those projected That's costs? That's within that the projected shown. costs, okay. yes. Um, we would then in January, February, be able to go out for bids, open those bids and know what the exact cost of a contractor um, willing to do that project would be. 
we would come back and review those with you, ask you to enter into a contract if it's acceptable um, in February, March timeframe. Depending on spring weather, rain most likely would be the thing that could get in the way a little bit and delay the start, but sometime in April and May, we could begin construction. And then thinking uh, July or August to be open and ready for play. And again, going back to that concept, we can do a base bid, we can do an alternate one, an alternate two, an alternate three. Um, probably don't want to get too carried away, but um, we could have some choices in January on what that number would be, and it would be based on dollars and, and real dollars that were, we would know we would be spending at that point. So I did cover most of the commission um, discussion, but um, their discussion really wasn't as much about dollars. They mentioned that a couple different times. It was like, it was about what is the overall impact on that park? We've spent a lot on upgrading the play structure. We've spent a lot on the, um, the amphitheater. We're about to spend some on the building to get that back. How do we make sure that we don't compromise any of these activities and the things that are already going on? So they, that was a, a big point for them. Um, concern about pushing that building out too far. Uh, we're pushing it on accessibility issues there. Um, and we've been getting by, just getting by for a while. And um, that is a old building and it was built before current codes and um, it's been band-aided. Can it work? Can people use it? Yeah. but. If you ask me what is our sorest thumb out there, I would say that's our sorest thumb in the park <coughs> system. So we want to do that at some point in the future. Um, so that's a consideration. And again, their conversation about are we providing for the community or are we providing for the region? We know at Franlo with the four courts, you see 30 to 40 people there at some times, usually that nine to 11 o'clock in the morning. And there is that. You play, you do a little bit of uh, rotating in and out, so there is some rest and socialization. But again, we also know of some people who say, I don't want to go there. I want to go to other places where there aren't that many people. Um, and I want to play with just my friends. And when I want to take a break, I'll take a break, but I don't want to have this prescribed way of playing. So we know that there's a faction of the community out there and that feels like that part is growing because at first, if you didn't know pickleball, the way to get in and know and play pickleball was to come to where all those people were. And, and they're a great group of people. There is a more accepting group of people that welcomes you and brings you in, but it isn't necessarily for everybody. So I think we hear a lot from the club, but I also think there is another group and, and multiple people. Everybody has different reasons and interests for playing what they play. And so I think we have to keep that in mind uh, as well. And so I think hopefully if we built more at Starry, it wouldn't mean that the money and, and time we put into Franlo decreases. Hopefully the interest is fully there and does keep in place. I don't know if I'm gonna would guarantee that based on others building around us. But mm -hmm. so again, that goes, our staff recommendation is on along that incremental lines. Where the start of that is, um, there again, there's multiple ways to think about that. And certainly when we come back with pricing, the real pricing, not just the estimates, there would be a way to even add in that component of what does it cost, not just what would we wish for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Nelson. Yes, I, I think four is too little. Uh, you know, I'll tell you that right now. Um, does it have to be eight? I think it's a good place, but six might would be better than four with the uh, additional two courts. Um, yes, it will put some more impact on this park, and certainly the playgrounds are used in the summertime and such. Um, which is another reason to have more benches in general around there. Uh, but this isn't a big weekend sport, I don't think. They might have an occasional big tournament, but it seems mostly the use is daytime use and non-weekend. A lot of the seniors that play aren't going by a work schedule that requires everything to be on a weekend. Um, 
it's possibly somewhat regional, but all the people I hear talking to me about it and so excited about it come from Eden Prairie. And I've been hearing them and having them talk excessively to me for years now. <laughs> and um, I happen to have some friends that are big pickleball enthusiasts. But um, I don't see this sport as going away because it's a sport that a lot of types of people can actually play. It's less strenuous than tennis is, but it still gets you out there. I think wherever we have multiple courts, we should make sure we have the amenities to go with them to make it useful for groups of people. I think it's very healthy for seniors to have things that do get them out and with groups of people. It probably you know, makes their lives a little bit longer and certainly a little more fun. And obviously, you don't play a lot of pickleball probably in February. But, um, but I, I really think four is too little for what I see the need is. And does it have to be 12? I'm not so sure about that. But when you bring back something to us, um, I want to see numbers for things greater than four. Six, eight, you know, how much is the incremental cost over if you wait to build it, if you build it now? There often it's cheaper to do it now. Um, but, and I respect certainly the Parks Commission but um, I think there is reason for more than four, so I don't want everything just based on the four, please. And if we need some other amenities, like some benches or some, you know, shade at, you know, at Franlo, maybe we need to build that into a piece of it too to add that to make that a better place for team play. Um, I don't think the seniors are going away. I think it's a growing group and it's going to continue growing. And people naturally play sports somewhere within reasonable size, unless, of course, you have a kid that's in traveling soccer or something, and then the whole state of Minnesota is your playground. But I don't think that's what we're talking about. Council Member Case. Yeah, as long as we're um, thinking about uh, giving direction on bringing us back additional information that could help us in our decision making, I. I'm not saying it's easy to go out and find a half a million dollars or a million dollars. It's not. And I want to always be um, not only responsible but conservative with that. But that being said, we have a 40-some million dollar annual budget and we have a quite large capital improvement fund. We have different ways to, to, to move monies around that can help us in any one moment deal with any uh, exigencies and vicissitudes that arise. So I'd, I'd love it if you could bring back um, options, not just, hey, it's the pavilion or nothing. You know, I mean, there's, there's just got to be, there just are other ways out there. I mean, I've even chatted with um, staff, and there's a few possibilities that they're all complicated, they're not easy, but I bring us back options um, on how one might fund this. Um, if, if, if we decide to go, I like Kathy's idea, if we decide to go different routes, you know, what, what it would look like in terms of funding. And, and, and the possibilities of realistic, maybe in that amount of time, meet with uh, Pickleball Association uh, leaders and try to get a reasonable estimate by that point on, you know, what could they raise if we, if we built six and we um, gave the incentive to, that we could go to ten, or if we built eight and the incentive that we could go above, realistically, what could they bring into this mix? Okay, I just want to make a few comments um, now that you guys are done, or did you want to go right else? ahead? Um, I'm very much in line with what the Park Rec and Natural Resource Commission um, voted on last night or decided last night. Um, pickleball is a great sport. I've enjoyed playing it when I've played it. I look forward to playing more of it in the future, but I do, I do have some problems with the issue of fairness to the rest of the community when it comes to building facilities. Um, we heard when Ron and I first got on the council in 94, the community center was in horrible shape. The pools were in horrible shape. The locker rooms were in ho horrible shape. We heard those for years and years and years and years. And finally, we got the pool upgrades done. And the Fox Jets raised a lot of money for that. And in addition, they also pay every time they use the pool. So, they were much 
closer partners on the development of that facility than we've seen with the potential for this. Um, same way with um, the disc golf course. We had some young men, 18, 20 year olds, this was like 15, 16 years ago that wanted to build a disc golf course. They went out and raised the money for disc golf and we built disc golf. Um, I think that was 100% funded by them. Perhaps, I mean, if you don't count the land that we put it on. Um, same with the hockey rinks. Um, the hockey players pay for every time they use ice, they're paying for it. Uh, in addition, they raised a lot of money to get that third sheet of ice built. So I have a little bit of a problem with the fairness of just responding to this um, in such a, a huge way. I mean, it's a great sport and it's popular, but um, then I respect the social aspect of it, but do we have some place where we have 10 basketball courts outside that young people can come and just rotate in and, and play games and have infinite number of courts and lots of people that they can play with? I mean, we, we, don't, we aren't able to do that. It would be nice if we could, but we're, we're not capable of providing that amount of um, facility for our, for our community. It's just not economically something we can do. Um, I don't know if it's changed, but when the few times that I have gone out and played pickleball, it's been primarily a morning sport. So are we building eight to 10 pickleball courts for people that only basically wanna play from 8.30 to 12 or one, and then the occasional tournament. I mean, that's, that's a big investment for courts that are not being used the rest of the time. So I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about who is this being built for. I think we should not build it for the, the Southwest Pickleball League. I'm sorry, a wonderful organization, but we shouldn't be building it for them. We should be building it for the residents of Eden Prairie. That's who's gonna pay for it. There's no hourly charge to the Southwest Pickleball Association to use these courts. So I think that's something that we have to think about. Um, the, as you mentioned, Jay, this is not in our CIP, so it means something has to go or something has to be delayed that is also um, an important thing. Um, I'm, I am concerned about noise. Um, if you are anywhere near the west side of the community, near the pickleball courts at um, Riley Lake, and they're being used, that sound carries, it carries over the lake, it carries over the golf course, you hear it. And we're gonna put 10 to 12 pickleball courts in Starring Lake, that sound is gonna carry all through that park, it's gonna carry over the lake, that's a lot of potential noise. So I'm, I'm really, I mean, it'd, yeah, it would be kinda cool if we had the money and we could build 10 to 12 pickleball courts, but I'm much more along the lines of thinking, let's, Think about incrementalism. Start out with four, with plans for increasing if if the sport considers continues to grow and we want to grow it. But I kind of like the idea of sticking a few permanent courts at Hidden Ponds and Rice Marsh for those members of our community that aren't interested in playing in a, a, a very welcoming um, but it's kind of organized uh, Southwest pickleball association format that they just want to go out with their friends and play. And where are they going to go? Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of leaning more towards four with developing plans so that we could increase it if it goes well. But um, to go whole hog and be talking about eight pickleball courts at Starring Lake, I think you know, we better have a neighborhood meeting because it's going to impact people in that whole north side and west side of the lake because they are going to hear that noise. I mean, we, we hear concerts from the, the pavilion there. We're going to hear, what, 32 people playing pickleball in eight courts? That's going to be a lot of noise. So um, I, I'm in favor of starting off with four. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It, it doesn't change. Um, the direction we're giving Jay, and that is come back to us right. with options, right? right. And so oh. it'll come back to us with four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Come back to us with money options. Come back to us with all the different possibilities and iterations. Yeah, I, I just to finalize that, as Jay said, there will be an action item at a future meeting, and that is an agreement with a consultant to start work on this. And I think, as you heard, 
the um, agreement and the work that'll be done into next year can scale this from four to six to eight. So this, again, it was a report. It was a chance to hear from the city council. And um, there's a different, you know, obviously there's a mix of opinions, but what we're doing can accommodate all of your opinions right now. Perfect. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you, Ms. Dodhammer. Um, the next item, oh, yes? Are you, oh, yes, come on. I had told you you could, yes. It should be. I want to thank the, uh, the council and, and Jay for all the efforts you've done on our behalf. I think there really are some pretty serious misconceptions about this sport and what, how this sport works. This is a gathering sport. It's not gathering three friends and going to a neighborhood park. It's 40 to 50 people, minimum of 30, that want to go to a facility and play pickleball together. That's how this sport is consumed. I think that will change, and I think Jay's alluded to that. It will change in the future. It will become more of a family sport. A four-court complex will be one more vastly overcrowded court with 20 people waiting. That doesn't help us. It, it, it doesn't meet the needs of Eden Prairie, and it doesn't meet the needs, uh, forget the club. We've got 200 players in Eden Prairie, and, most, and they're going to be waiting, they're still waiting on courts. Chanhassen is vastly overcrowded right now. Terrible. You have to wait and wait and wait. Edina, we thought, well, we'll build Edina. That'll solve all our problems. Edina is terribly overcrowded. Um, four won't help us. It, 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 we can't raise money for four. And I'll try to be very brief here in respect of, of your time. But the sport's exploding. We have 20 new members a month, about 50 new, member, 50 new players a month. We can't keep up. We got to look to the future. We got to plan ahead. Um, this sport is, it, it's, it's going crazy. Um, people don't want to set up temporary nets anymore. They, that's why Riley is not getting used. They don't want to set up those nets. Um, regarding fundraising, you know, this chicken and egg thing was not brought up by us. It was brought up by the commission last night. I, I used the term back at them, but we're both right, and I had no problem with that term. But we had nothing to fundraise for. There was a concept last January that, was, that we presented that the council saw for 12 courts. We went out and did fundraising. We, we, did, we filled out 12 grant applications. Most of them were due up April 15th or sooner. We've been rejected by three. We've got nine that are still alive. We were told very clearly that this would take eight to nine months. We were waiting to hear back this month, October, on several of these applications. And there's been a lot of communication in the meantime. We haven't gone to club level fundraising yet, because what am I going to go tell them? There, there was nothing on the table. It is a chicken and egg problem, and it's, it's, a, valid, it's a valid term. So a little bit about that. Uh, we do feel we can raise money. Uh, another point is no, no, metropolitan, no metropolitan city has asked the public to raise money for pickleball courts. This would be a first. Maybe we should, based on hockey and the Miracle Field. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but that hasn't been the case. There was a, a, a grant in Edina for $150,000. That was an unsolicited grant that helped build those courts. Uh, granted. Um, another thing, that, you know, cost is a huge issue. We understand that. We're, you know, we, and we did agree to donate $10,000, which would do a pretty good job on our treasury as a club. We're not a big club. We know that's a drop in the bucket. We understand that. Um, but I think, I think there is an issue of, of usage as well. You know, we're, we are not here to supplant tennis. Many, many, many of our players are tennis players. They play pickleball in the morning, they go play tennis in the afternoon. We have nothing against tennis. We feel there are more than enough tennis courts in this community. It's not the way it used to be where everyone played tennis. You know, we could, in terms of budget, we, we, could, we could take out the tennis court in starring and, and add four more pickleball courts just like that and save a ton of money, a ton of money. Um, Richfield was built over a, eight courts. They have eight brand new courts this summer, built over a, a worn out tennis court. Chan Hassan was built over a worn out tennis court. Uh, it's, it's a very common scenario. So we're not here to pick on tennis. We love tennis, but, but that's a, a viable alternative as well. But I, I want to make sure that you understand that the need is, is an urgent need. We're overcrowded. It's going to get worse. People, we, we, we haven't, Bob Lancey runs, a, runs leagues, and they fill up in an hour. 
we're going, we're telling people they can't play. We get calls from people for the for the Fourth of July celebration, and they and they're mad because they can't play. We can't accommodate them. They blame us. We need we need courts. We need permanent courts. Four will be will this be another overcrowded court? And we recommend you not do it. If it's four or nothing, we're going to recommend you not do it. Save your money. We don't think it's going to solve any problems at all. Six probably won't either. It's still going to be overcrowded. Eight maybe we'll start to solve our problem. No more, less than that, I don't, I don't think it's, it's worth, it's, it's good use of your money. I'm gonna tell you not to do it. But we need the courts, we need them now, and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have a report from the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District, Mr. Getschow, or Mr. Ellis. Madam Mayor, give them a few minutes. Okay, Madam Mayor, City Council members, as you have probably uh, been aware, citizen contacts I think have been coming in about uh, the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District updating their watershed management plan. And they're making a number of changes, most of them uh, fairly innocuous, a lot of clerical changes, but there is one that's raising quite a few eyebrows and that's a definition, uh, change in definition for what constitutes a bluff. And the way the city and the state and the watershed currently define a bluff is that it's a feature that rises 25 feet, is within a vicinity of a shoreland area, and that would be a lake, a creek, a river, and has a slope of 30% for an average slope, and also has a structure setback from the top of the bluff of 30 feet. They're proposing to change that to a slope that is 18% as opposed to the 30% average slope, no longer has to be just within a shoreland area, it can be anywhere within the district. Mm. And it pushes that structure setback an additional 10 feet, so from 30 feet to 40 feet. So the city is concerned about that. We've drafted a letter uh, recommending that they leave <coughs> that definition unchanged because we are a built community. Our, our bluff areas have been developed on the current standard and this would essentially create a number of non-conforming properties. So we've said we're concerned about this we would like to leave it left as is. We've asked that they broaden their public outreach because quite frankly, there hasn't been much public outreach at all. Uh, the city took it upon themselves to notify the 175 plus properties in Eden Prairie that are impacted. We know that Bloomington sent out 700 letters to their residents that would be impacted. So we've asked them to really put a halt on this, do more education, public outreach, engage the public on what they feel about these changes before they make a decision. So uh, we, we think that we might be getting their attention on that. I know the city has sent their letter. The city of Bloomington has also done their letter, urging other cities to do the same. And they have decided to push back their public hearing from October 18th to October 25th. So they're trying to provide a little bit more time uh, for the public to respond to this. Uh, and I think that they will be notifying all the individual property owners of this proposed change as well. So uh, more to come, but I did want to let you know because you have been getting contacted by citizens. You probably will continue to be contacted by citizens because we've made a concerted effort to let people know what's going on. Uh, recognizing that there isn't much the city can do to change this or influence other than provide our comments, but we felt it was important that you knew this so that if you had an opinion, you would share that with the watershed district. So. So is it still a 25 foot height? Yes, the 25 foot height would not change. The things that would change again would be the sl average slope going from 30% to 18%. Setback. No longer required to be in a shoreland area, so it could be features or uh, facilities that are or a bluff that is away from a lake, creek, or stream. And then again, the structure setback is pushed back an additional 10 feet. 
And from the top did they the give bottom. reasons as to why they're making these changes? Well, they really haven't, and that was another comment is most oftentimes watershed districts are required to do a sonar, a statement of need and reasonability um, to explain, well, what is the problem and how will this be the solution? How, how is this solving that problem? We haven't seen that. They've, they've said that they would provide that at a later date, but we kind of think that's the cart before the horse. You need yeah, to do really. the sonar first yeah. and then, and then recommend you, yeah, the solution. You find what the problem is and then you find the solution. It sounds so, like a solution in yeah. search of a problem. Huh. Okay. Okay, and then when is where is the public hearing? You said it's been changed October 25th? Yeah, it's been changed October 25th from what we've heard. The watershed district will be making that official announcement once they know that they have a quorum that would be available that night. And it would be at their Chaska offices where the watershed district meets on their monthly. Okay. Um, Council Member Wickstrom. Yeah, I just have a question. So this is the Lower Minnesota River Valley, River Valley uh, Watershed District. So that definition of a bluff, is that, I mean, legally, is that, can this one watershed district have that? Yes, they, they can make that change. They have been granted that authority through the legislature to draft those rules that they see fit to protect water resources and that that definition I mean that definition changes impacts so many people and I would imagine that there are, are bluffs along lots of different rivers the Minnesota or the Mississippi River yeah so well that's interesting well maybe we need to talk with our legislators about a, that ability to define something so important as bluffs and only have it defined by one watershed district. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Case. And I had a question on um, the non-compliancy piece. So it's going to put, I, I can just picture, I, I know all these homes along Riverview Road there, so I can picture in my head right away 30 homes that are non-compliant. So obviously you don't move their houses, but it would impact them, I'm assuming, if they could have put a deck on under the old rules, now they can't. I mean, is that kind of uh, impact majorly? Um, doesn't that begin, uh, this is more Mr. Russell question, it's more academic, you don't need to answer in the moment, but it almost seems like a takings because it's after the fact. They bought under a certain set of rules. Now they're inhibited, limited, which would impact their financial you know, ability to market. And I mean, are, is there that, okay, it's an academic question. We can take it offline, but <laughs> it just seems like this is broader and I agree with Sherry's point of letting the legislature get involved. Uh, I mean, I'm a bluff um, uh, admirer, protector. protector, whatever, and we always have been as a council. Uh, but the idea of um, of changing the rules mid-game, I'm, I'm also been yeah. a, a person involved in government that believes that government should never do that to its people, uh, is change the rules mid-game. Uh, say we'll never build a gas station, then rezone and put a gas station next door, or whatever, that's extreme. But uh, So I, I don't um, like this idea at all. And I don't know, since we are built out, that it's doing anything in terms of further protecting our, our Eden Prairie lands, just inhibiting um, the people, our residents, our constituents from um, potentially um, fully actualizing the benefits of their property. Uh, Council Member Nelson. Yeah, I'm concerned about that too. I think it's a lot more than just that area you talked about. It's everything along Riverview Road and such. It's sort of a small piece of Eden Prairie, but it does, you know, go most of the bluffs. Now, I've worked to save a lot of bluffs and to move things back and to keep them off the edge. So, uh, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of that. But it doesn't seem fair, you know, there's all styles of houses. It's not just big ones. There's townhouses and there's, you know, more average homes that have been built in there over time. And, you know, what happens if they've been there long enough that their deck is rotten and they need to put in a new deck? And will the rule be, no, you can't put in a new deck or you live with your rotten deck or what? Yeah, um, I think those are sort of a big deal. And, you know, there's a couple of places it'll change maybe what could be built, but most of it's already there. And it's well back from the edge of the bluff. 
And so, and I'm also, I don't know if it really do that many people. I guess I can think of a couple of lots. Things that aren't leading down into watershed, can they really govern what happens to things that are nowhere near water? Or nowhere near wetlands or any such thing? Um, and you know, I would really have a legal question about how they do that. Now, the common sense says is you don't build a house someplace where it's going to fall down the hill. And I think we do a pretty good job of not letting people do that. But um, yeah, no, this is going to put one whole more section of things that applies to one little corner of the city that doesn't apply to people in other parts of the city. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to impact homes and values and what people do as their home gets a little bit older and they need to do something for safety, like a deck. Re restructuring it. Council member case. So Robert, you say that it's out of our purview because it's really the watershed, but but it's within our ability to pass a resolution and make a recommendation and, and again, represent and speak on behalf of our constituents. So I would like to do that. I don't know what the rest of the council, not tonight. Uh, if, if staff could help us um, bring back something that would be a resolution to send. I realize, let's see, it won't be within time for their meeting. Um, on. I think it would be our, our next council meeting is two weeks from tonight. 17th. Yeah, 17th. Okay. So, so, so if would we could time. have something yeah. prepared and get right into their hands that, um, and, 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 and um, fairly direct, I mean, as a statement and with a rationale, I think that would be um, important. Is, are you all okay with that? Okay. If we could do that. Also, a statement saying how careful we have been with bluffs over time. Now, where we have gone above and beyond. All expectation for keeping bluffs safe here. So, Mr. Ellis, did you say that letters have already gone out to Eden Prairie residents that are impacted by this? Uh, Madam Mayor, the engineering division sent out letters to homeowners. <laughs> the watershed district has not. Okay, the engineering department. Okay, this I'm trying to figure out like why I didn't get a letter because it seems like my house is 25 feet. But you don't live in that watershed district. You're, yeah. And Madam Mayor, oh, you're, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. in the Riley okay, Riley the wrong it, okay. And so um, to clarify, as, as uh, Councilmember Nelson said earlier, it is mainly those properties yeah. along the Minnesota River. It covers the least amount of area of the three watersheds in our city. However, there are, um, you know, unlike the other watershed districts where we've had issues with the rules, in this case, we have um, several other cities that are in this watershed that are concerned and are commenting as well. So a big portion of Bloomington and Burnsville and part of Egan and um, Shaska, Chanhass, and I don't know the, I mean, obviously you can think about the Minnesota River, right? So it covers many communities and I think some of the uh, staff members in those communities um, were talking and conversing and sharing comment letters with each other and we will pass along to our colleagues as well that our city council might take action in the form of a resolution too. So we'll keep in communication and follow what the other communities are doing as well. Should we copy our legislators <clears throat> on that? Mm -hmm. Oh, we could do that as well. Yes. I think it would be good to keep them in the loop. Well, yeah, we can do that, certainly. Mm -hmm. Did you have something else? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, Mr. Getchell. Thank you. Ross. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ross. Okay. You want to do it? No. Um, a couple of you have asked about the non-conforming use issue and, and I would, it, it's too early to really draw a legal conclusion about all of this, but what is very concerning is this non-conforming use issue because there are lots of protections that have been built into the law by the legislature with respect to non-conforming uses that <clears throat> emanate from the zoning enabling statute. So the things that affect us. So homeowners, property owners are protected to a large extent by the law that applies to zoning and nonconforming uses. This isn't zoning. And I don't have the answer for you as to what protections would they have in the scenarios that you raise because the rules that come out of chapter 462 
would not necessarily apply. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a very serious uh, It's a new case issue. law to be um, written <laughs> oh. through lawsuits, yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right, any other business to bring before the council tonight? Seeing none, I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.